Amen. Well, good morning, friends. I want to invite you to take your Bibles and open it up to the book of Philippians. That's where we're going to be at over the next uh, numerous months together, uh, studying this incredible book uh, together. And uh, it's just so good to be back uh, with you, um, to be preaching God's Word. Um, Hopefully, I remember how to do this. Uh, But first service went okay, so I think we're I think we're going to be all right. For those of you that are new in the past two months, I haven't had the chance yet to uh, meet you face to face. Probably, I would love to do that. Um, hopefully, you got an email from me this week if you fill out a guest card any time in the last couple months. And uh, I'm I'm sincere that I would love to just sit down and get to know you better and hear your story and how the Lord brought you where you are today and and how we might be able to help as a church to be able to help you grow, uh, continue that growth in your faith. Uh, for everyone else, it's not only good to be back, but I also bring you greetings from the Murnos who are serving uh, in Slovenia, along with the Wicks who are there as well. My wife and I had a chance to meet them, and uh, well, I mean, we know them. We've got a chance to spend time with them, and, and, uh, and they were just so grateful for uh, our church and the work that our church has uh, been in their lives. Um, and also the McLeans. We got to go over to the Republic of Georgia, which I'm sure many of you have never been to. I had never been to. Uh, former Soviet Union. Uh, that was quite the experience for us, and uh, we'll talk about it at some point. But um, we are going to share uh, during the family meeting, we'll share about our, our sabbatical trip a little bit and what the Lord taught us and those kinds of things. And so I hope you're there to, uh, to be a part of that with us as well. But this morning, we're going to start in the book of Philippians together. And as I've been reading this book over the last two months, I was trying not to study it, but I was trying to allow it to just kind of saturate into my heart and life. And I was just, again, just struck by how much is packed into this small letter to the church. There's so much rich theology and encouragement in this letter. In fact, in fact, Philippians has so many powerful verses that have been such a great help and encouragement to many of us. Uh, so many of us know a lot of these verses, may, maybe by heart, but at least know the general idea of these verses as soon as we hear them, because they have been such a great encouragement in our Christian life. You think of verses like Philippians 121, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Or Philippians 2, 3, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Or Philippians 3, 13, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on. Or Philippians 4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say, rejoice. Or how about Philippians 4.13? I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And we could go on and on and on of the verses in Philippians that give us strength and encouragement. But the question we want to answer as we walk through this book together is how do all of these verses fit together? Why were they written in the first place? Who were they written to? And what were they going through that where they needed these words to be written to them? What is the hope and expectation that Paul is, is, wants in writing this letter? What is he hoping to see happen in the life of this church? These and, and so many other questions are what I hope we get, gain as we walk through this book together. And I truly believe that this is going to be one of the most important journeys through Scripture that we take as a church. We've, we've had incredible times of studying incredible books together, but, but I think this book ha- is going to be a, a special journey for us as a church, and I think it's going to do great things in our lives and in our hearts and in the life of our church. And so I'm incredibly ex- excited to start this journey together by looking at the first two verses. And so we're going to look at Philippians 1, 1 through 2 this morning. So turn there with me as I read God's holy and inspired word. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, along with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father 
and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to your word, we recognize, Lord, our dependence upon you. God, we are limited in our knowledge, limited in our understanding, limited in our strength and abilities. And while oftentimes we walk in pride, Lord, there's no reason for that pride because we are absolutely dependent. And we are dependent upon you this morning, Lord. Would you open your word to us? Would you reveal the areas in our own lives, God, that need to be changed and transformed by the power of your Holy Spirit? Would you use your word to do that in us, Lord? And so make our hearts soft and receptive. Open up our minds to hear your truth. Remove every other distraction and let us hear from you this morning, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you were in a hurry as you began to read this book, it might be tempting for you to just skip over this introduction that Paul has written. You think like, I'm going I'm to read, I'm going to get to the good stuff. So just kind of skip through this introductory part. But by doing that, you would miss some of the most significant themes that Paul wants to introduce. That would be a serious error because in this introduction, he masterfully introduces us to the ideas that he wants us to gain throughout the rest of the entire letter. He models for the readers what he is going to try to encourage in their own lives, the humility of Jesus Christ. Now, these two verses do follow the customary introductory uh, pattern of a letter in Greco-Roman culture. This is what you would find. It included an author, it included a recipient, and a greeting. But Paul takes that normal author-recipient greeting, and he subtly and masterfully introduces the themes that will set the tone for the whole letter and his goal in writing it. And so to understand it, we have to read it carefully and thoughtfully and see what he's trying to say. But before we can even get to this introduction, I think it's important that we first start with some setting and understanding of what is going on and background for this letter. The church of Philippi uh, is from the city of Philippi. And we're first introduced to this Roman colony, this Roman city, in Acts chapter 16. And if you were with us in our study of the book of Acts, uh, perhaps you remember that Paul is on his second missionary journey. He has gone out, he has planted churches, he's gone back, um, some things have happened in Jerusalem, he's sent back out, he takes some people with him, and as he goes out on this second missionary journey, he's going back out to strengthen the churches that he's planted. But in the midst of doing that, he gets a dream or a vision. And in that vision, there is a person who stands before him who is from the area of Macedonia, or what we would say modern-day Europe, who says, please come and help us. And so Paul changes his plans and his direction, and he goes across the sea, and he goes to the Roman Empire. And the first major Roman city that Paul encounters is the city of Philippi. Now, Paul's normal practice when he went into a city was to find a synagogue to preach the gospel to the Jews. And then after some received him, some rejected him, then he would go and he would preach to the Gentiles. When he arrives at Philippi, he finds no synagogue. It was required for at least there to be 10 Jewish adult men for there to be a synagogue, and there wasn't even that in, the, in, the, in this Roman colony. This was thoroughly Gentile, thoroughly Roman, and as he encounters the city, he goes to the only place where there are God-fearers who are gathering, and that is out by the river uh, outside of the city. He goes to gather with these women that have gathered to pray. They are those that fear God but don't really know him that much. They just have received information about, uh, about this God, and, and they go, uh, they're praying to this God, and Paul goes out and he preaches the gospel to them. And as he preaches the gospel to them, there is one significant um, conversion, which is a, a woman named Lydia. She is uh, wealthy, uh, and she begins to host the church in her home. 
After Paul uh, uh, preaches the gospel to Lydia, soon after in the book of Acts, we see that Paul encounters this little girl who's demon-possessed. And she's spitting out all this stuff against Paul. And Paul casts the demon out of this girl. Well, that doesn't go over too well. Uh, The owners of this girl were using her demonic powers to make money. And so they bring Paul to the city leaders and get him in trouble. And they throw Paul in jail. And if you remember the story in the book of Acts, while Paul is in jail overnight, there's a massive earthquake that takes place. The jails are split open. And the jailer who thinks that all that the, all of the prisoners have escaped goes to take his very own life because he knows he will be executed for losing prisoners. And Paul cries out and says, stop, we're all here. We're just praising the Lord. We're worshiping together. Nothing to worry about. And Paul preaches the gospel to this jailer. And this man also, too, becomes a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this is the, the start of the church in Philippi, a wealthy God-fearing woman, a little girl who was demon-possessed, and a jailer of the Roman Empire. Eventually, the officials uh, figure out that Paul is actually a Roman citizen. They are fearful of the fact that they have flogged him and, and put him in jail without cause, and so they release him and they tell him to please leave the city without causing too much harm or issue. Paul then goes back to Lydia's house encourages and strengthens the little band of believers that are there now, and then continues on his missionary journey. And it's through these humble beginnings that God begins this church that will have a significant influence and impact even in our lives today. This little church becomes so incredibly dear to the Apostle Paul. He loves these people, and we read that in this letter. And they love him. And we read that in this letter as well. In verses 3 through 5, which we'll look at next week, but you can just see there, Paul says, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. This church has been a great encouragement to him. They have provided for his needs physically and financially. They have cared for him. They love him. And he loves them. Well, fast forward. About 10 to 12 years, Paul has now been arrested by the Roman Empire. He is now in prison awaiting a verdict of what they will do with him. And during that time, not only does he share the gospel, as we'll see in the book of Philippians, but he also writes these letters to the churches. Now, the church of Philippi had taken an offering to try to help Paul. They loved him. Uh, in Roman cult, in Roman prison, there was no, uh, you know, state-sanctioned meals. Uh, if you wanted to eat, your family would bring you food, or your friends would bring you food, or you would die in prison from starvation. There was no assistance in prison, and so Paul's the churches that Paul has ministered to. Some of them begin to send support. One of them being the Church of Philippi, and so they take an offering, they raise money and support. And they send all of this with a man named Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus goes to Rome, which is a distance from Philippi. Uh, He finds Paul in prison, and he cares for him. And he fills him in on all the things that are happening in the life of the church. He tells them about the good and the bad. He tells them about how the he, Paul can be praying for them. He tells them about how the church has grown. He probably tells them about new people that have come to the church and new converts and the work that they're doing. And just like when we were over, overseas on sabbatical, we got a, a great opportunity to share with our missionaries and, and we were telling them about you. And we were sharing about what God is doing in our church. And we were sharing about all the things that God's been up to and, and the things that have happened. And, we've been, and we were greatly encouraged, both of us, as we, as we shared back and forth one another with what God was doing. Well, that's what Epaphroditus was doing. And Paul hears what's happening in the life of the church. And in response to that, he writes this letter. He writes this letter to be sent back with Epaphrodites to go to the church so that they can be uh, encouraged, so that he can thank them for their gift and their support, and so that he can pastorally address some of the things that he heard that Epaphroditus 
shared with him during this time. Paul writes because he loves them. He writes because he is their pastor, because he has a shepherd heart for them. And he wants to help them through some of the difficulties and challenges that that they are facing. This is not a letter of rebuke. This is a letter of pastoral care and concern. He specifically addresses a number of issues. One of them is that he addresses how to live in a godless age facing persecution, which this church was enduring. He writes to them about how to respond to false teachers that are trying to woo them away from the gospel of Jesus Christ back into Judaism, into legalism. And we see that in chapter 3. And he writes to them about how to have unity in Christ in the face of disagreement and division in the church. And as we learn in chapter 4, that's what's happening in in, in a specific situation in the life of the church. The disunity and division of two ladies in particular are of great concern to Paul. It's become such an issue in the life of the church that Paul can actually address these women by name because their division and their disagreement is known not just among themselves, but among others. And people are beginning to take sides and they are beginning to listen to gossip and they are beginning to cause division. And so Paul writes to urge them to unity, to urge them to forgiveness, to urge them to humility and reconciliation. And it is this last theme of unity in Christ and the humility necessary for that unity that permeates throughout this entire letter, that once you understand the themes and the stories, you'll be able to see, as you read through the letter, you'll be able to see this theme over and over and over again. And it is that theme which this introduction that Paul gives so masterfully reveals to us. In verses 1 and 2, we see a humble greeting that hopes to create a humble church. We see a humble greeting that hopes to create a humble church. And we see that first in the description of the author. We see that by the, by the, way, by the way that Paul introduces himself alongside Timothy. Look at verse 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. Now, there's little doubt that Paul is the one who wrote this letter. Unlike other letters and transactions or uh, uh, things that Paul wrote, there there are not uh, um, plural pronouns in this letter. There's no we in this letter. There's only I. In fact, in verse 3, we see, I thank my God. Paul is writing this letter. So why then does he introduce this letter, Paul and Timothy? Well, for one, the the church knew Timothy. Timothy had been part of their journey as well. They loved Timothy. And so Paul writes to say, not only am I saying this, but also, Timothy, we are in agreement that these things need to be part of your church. But I think even more significantly than that, Paul is modeling humility from the very beginning. By speaking not just of himself as an apostolic leader, but speaking of him and Timothy combined together as servants of the Lord. The plurality of leadership is meant to foster humility. You see, the reason God has designed his churches so that they are led by a plurality of called, qualified, competent, godly men is for the sake of humility. Plurality is meant to breed humility. It's meant to have a group of of, of godly men that have to wrestle together and submit to one another, that have to say, I am not the first, I am not dominant, right? There are times in the life of our church as an elder, I've been in elder meetings, and there were times that I just wanted to say, listen, I don't care what you have to say, I planted this church, 
we're doing it this way, and you can get on or you can get off, right? There's been, there's been temptations to do that. But God has set it in such a way that I must submit myself to the plurality of leaders that are with me in shepherding the church. There's a beauty in that, 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 that we sometimes don't even fathom. God has designed his church in such a way that humility is at the very center of leadership. It is servant leadership. A domineering, a abusive, an aggressive, a, a, those are not leadership qualities of a pastor. They're leaderships of an organization. They might be leaderships of a CEO. They might be leaderships of big companies or businesses or even ministries. But they have nothing to do with being a pastor. A pastor is a shepherd, a servant. And Paul demonstrates it from the very beginning, humility. You know what is humbling? It is humbling to come back from a sabbatical and for the church to be larger than you left. It is humbling to come back to a church and realize, you don't need me. God does not need me. God can do this without me. But it's also a blessing to realize that I have a church that loves me and actually wants me to be here. That there are people that come alongside me and say, we're so grateful that you're back. That is a blessing, but it's also humbling to realize this church would survive without me. Now, there are times in the life of the church where I might have struggled a little more with that thought, but, but not now. This church is healthy and strong. It is a strong, godly membership who love Jesus, who love his word, who will, be, who will be faithful to his word, regardless of what pastor stands in the pulpit. They will be faithful to God's word. It is a humbling thing. And it is this idea of plurality that Paul is modeling as he begins this letter. It is a concrete way of reflecting the very attitude that he wants this church to have. Will you be humble like Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ? Notice the word that he uses to describe both him and Timothy. Leaders in the church, servants of Christ. Now, Notice here, he does not describe himself as an apostle. Most of the times when Paul introduces himself, he introduces himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. But because he is trying to start this letter from a point of humility, because he is going to emphasize humility, he begins by placing himself in that position of humility. There are three other places, three other letters where Paul does not describe himself as an apostle. This is the fourth place where he does not describe himself as an apostle. But this is the only place where Paul mentions two names together, himself and another person, and uses one single word to describe the two people. Every other place you look, he's going to use a, a name for himself, Paul an apostle, and Silas a servant. He's going to use a different descriptor. But here, because he's trying to model humility from the beginning, he uses one word to describe both he and Timothy, and that is the word servant. Well, better yet, that is the word slave. The actual word in the Greek here is slave. It's the word doulos in Greek. And those that were part of a, a, a Greek culture, they would have understood that word to mean only one thing. There was another word for a household servant. This was the word for slave. But because of our horrific history with the evil and the sin of slavery in our own country, very few English translations choose to use that word anymore because it carries so much connotation with it and can be confusing in some ways. But that is the word he uses, slave. And in a culture where slavery was very real in the day-to-day -day life, that word carried a visual picture and visual meaning to these readers. When you are a slave, you are not your own. You have been bought with a price. You do not belong to yourself any longer. You do not live for yourself any longer. You belong for another. You serve another. 
and your whole life is transformed by that identity. Paul says, I am a slave of Christ Jesus. And because Christ is our master, it's okay for us to be a slave because he is a good master. He is the one who loves us and cares for us and only has our best for us. And so Paul joyfully calls himself a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you want to use the word servant, that's fine as well. That's the context is to serve and obey and to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Paul is saying he is. You know, there's only one other place in the book of Philippians where this word doulos is used. Can you guess where it is? It's in Philippians chapter 2, verse 7. It is speaking of Christ himself. Christ emptied himself by taking the form of a doulos, of a slave, being born in the likeness of men. Christ humbled himself so that we could be saved. And this is the attitude that Paul is going to plead with the church to have. This is the humility that Paul is going to try to form back into the life of this church. And this is the attitude that Paul is going to model from the very beginning by calling himself a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I am simply a servant. I am simply a slave of the Lord. I live for his glory. And that's what our lives are to be as well, friends. One of the identifying markers of a follower of Jesus, we belong to the Lord. We don't belong to ourselves anymore. We don't live for ourselves. We don't live for our glory. We don't live for our rights. We don't live for our power. We live for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. We walk in obedience to his word. We submit ourselves to his word. We submit ourselves to what he leads us in and what he calls us to. And we do so joyfully and gladly. This is the example of Paul. And we have to ask at this, this stop, we have to stop and ask at this point, does this describe me? Am I a servant of the Lord? Do I allow the Lord to guide every decision of my life? Or have I given God part of me, but I've kept quite a bit back to myself? Do I submit my, 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 my plans to the Lord? Do I submit my money to the Lord, my time to the Lord, my resources to the Lord? Do I belong to Him? Do I live to serve Him? Does His Word guide my life? Do we see the attitude of humility in our lives? These are the questions that we need to ask as Paul introduces us to this. Paul is a servant, and his hope is that we would be as well. And so we see humility in the author. But we also see humility in the description of the readers. We see humility in the description of the readers. Look how Paul introduces the readers. We saw how he introduces himself, a slave. Look how he introduces the readers. To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and the deacons. Paul identifies himself as a slave, but he identifies the church as saints. He's reminding them of their true identity. He's reminding them that they have been called out of darkness into light, that they have been redeemed, that they have been saved, that they are God's holy people. That's what the, that's what the word means. It means holy. It means consecrated, set apart. And how humbling would it have been for those that were arguing and bickering in the life of the church who were causing division in the church to hear Paul call them saints because they sure weren't acting like it. Paul is trying to lift them up to what they should be, reminding them of, them, them of who they actually are you are God's holy people. Your lives should look like it. Your, your thoughts should be God's thoughts. Your actions should reflect your Savior. This word saints, it's, it's a shorthand to describe God's people. And 
uh, it's the same way that Peter uses to describe the church in 1 Peter chapter 2. He uses the same kind of language to describe God's people. He says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You are God's holy people. That's what Paul is saying by the word saints. To all the saints, to all those that God has redeemed and rescued, God's holy people, he's reminding them of who they are, even though they're not acting like it. You are God's holy people, so live like that. Act like that. You know, part of the problem in America with the weakness of our church, uh, the church in America in general, is that we've lost holiness. That, are, that we look just like the world around us. That there's no difference other than we attend church on Sunday. That is not what God has called us to. We are a people that are to be set apart. We are to be a city on a hill, a light to the world around us. And our lives are to look different. We should think different. We should act different. We should live different. Our lives should be different. And we need to ask ourselves, is there any difference in my life? Is there holiness in my life? Not perfection. None of us are perfect. But we are to be sanctified and and moving more towards the image of Jesus Christ. That's what everything we do as a church is try try to help one another in that purpose and that goal. We can't do much of what's going on in the world around us, but we can within our local body. We can help one another. We can encourage one another. We can challenge one another. And we can try to walk faithfully together. You are God's holy people. We are the children of the Lord. We belong to him. Our lives and everything about us should be radically different. That's why Paul will say to them over and over again, You should be blameless and pure. You need to abound in love. In Philippians 1.27, he's going to say, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of you, that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. And in Philippians 2, 2, 2 and 3, he says, Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. You see, that is the upside-down kingdom that we've been called to. That is the upside-down world that we've been called to. Not to positions of power, but to positions of weakness. Not to positions of pride, but to positions of humility. And Paul is trying to re-foster in this church what they knew when they believed the gospel, that, that Christians walk by humility. We count others more significant than ourselves. Friends, remember you are saints. Remember you are God's holy people. He goes on to say with the overseers and deacons. Not only is this letter directed towards all of the members which make up the church, but I think Paul mentions the leaders of the church because they will lead and the church will follow. The church will go as they lead. As the leaders go, so goes the church. And they won't lead by positions of power. They'll lead by serving. They won't lead by, uh, uh, by domineering. They'll lead by humility. This is a humbling reminder of the awesome responsibility that God gives to the leaders of his church, that they are to serve him and God's people. That's why it's a humbling thing, but it's also God warns people about stepping into areas of leadership. 
He says, you need to be an example. You need to live your life above reproach. And part of the reason that, the, again, the American church is so weak is because we have elevated talent over character. And the church has suffered. The church has been called to be led by godly men who are humble and lead by example. That is a sobering reality. That is a reality as I wake up every morning and go to the Lord and pray and say, God, I need your grace today. I cannot do this in my own strength. I cannot do this in my own power. I need your grace. And that's exactly what Paul prays for the church. He prays that they would know God's grace. And so thirdly, we see the humility in the description of the greeting. Humility in the description of the greeting. Verse 2, Paul says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the customary Greco-Roman greeting of a letter would be the author, the recipient, and a greeting. And the greeting was often just one word in Greek. It was the word uh, to rejoice, but... And more uh, got understood as just the word greetings. Greetings to you. And Paul takes that word and he tweaks it and he Christianizes the greeting that he gives to this church. And he does that in, in almost all of his letters. He, he, he takes this word joy or karen or rejoice and he turns it into uh, this idea of grace and peace. And oftentimes when we read these introductions, we're in such a rush that we just skip over these words. We've heard them a hundred times. Grace and peace, grace and peace, grace and peace. Yeah, yeah, I get it. But I want, well, we need to stop and really think about what these words mean. Because this is what Paul is praying for the church. He's praying for grace. You know what grace is? Grace is undeserved mercy. It is mercy that is not earned, mercy that is not deserved. It is given because of God's love. That's what, we rec- that's what we received in Jesus Christ. That is the central heart of the gospel, that you and I, by our rebellion against God, our sin against God, we deserved God's righteous wrath. That's what we deserved. We deserve separation from God. We deserve to be eternally damned from God. And instead, God gave us grace. He gave us mercy. We couldn't save ourselves. And so he had to rescue us. He sent his only son who was perfect, who was God and man together in the flesh, who would come and who would live in humility, who would live as a child and a young adult, And a man who would go through the temptations that you and I experience yet without sin. He would perfectly obey God's law in ways that you and I could never do. And then he would offer his perfect life that had satisfied God's perfect law. He would offer himself upon the cross and he would die in my place and for my sins and for yours. He would not only lose his life, but he would face the righteous wrath of God for all of sin of all of mankind that would put their faith in Jesus Christ. And because Jesus would take that upon himself, he then could offer us his righteousness for our rebellion. And the good news of the gospel is that if you'll come in humility, if you'll come in faith, and you'll believe what Jesus did is for you, And you'll cry out to God and say, God, I recognize that I'm a sinner. I believe that Christ died in my place and I confess him as Lord and I give my life to you. The Bible says that you will receive salvation. You will receive mercy, undeserved mercy. And Paul is writing to this church to remind them, friends, you have received mercy. God has forgiven you. So then how can you not forgive one another? Jesus uses this illustration as well in his own parable in Matthew 18. He talks this parable about an unforgiving servant who is brought before the king. 
And he owes an insurmountable debt to this king. And yet the king, out of grace, forgives the debt. And the servant goes and he leaves. And as he's walking out, he runs into a, a, a person that owes him a small amount of money. And he takes that person and he grabs him and he throws his family in jail. And he says, you'll pay me everything that you owe me, every last penny. And Jesus says, what do you think will happen when the king hears this? The king will drag that man back in front of him. And he will say, I forgave you everything. And you can't forgive this little nothing that is owed you, you will spend the rest of your life paying off the debt you owe me. And Jesus uses it as an example to say, listen, friends, you and I have received forgiveness and mercy so that we can extend that to others. Think about what you have been forgiven in Christ how then can we possibly not forgive others who have sinned against us? That is what Paul is going to be driving this church towards. It won't be until we get to chapter 4 that we realize the, 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 the situation that's taking place in the life of the church that is the cause and reason for all that he is saying. But he is starting from the very beginning with this heart and this attitude to say, listen, you need to know and understand the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, how I would hope that the grace of God would pour over you more and more so that then you could live out the grace of Jesus and be a church that loves one another and forgives one another and speaks kindly of one another. Oh, how we need the grace of God. And that grace then leads to peace. That's the final thing he prays for them. And peace in the Bible is not just the absence of conflict, but peace is really the presence of God. It is the Hebrew way of greeting people, shalom. It is, it, is, it is wholeness, blessing, fullness, and peace. And because we have been shown mercy in Christ, we then can receive the peace of God. Peace with God. We are no longer enemies against God. He is no longer enemies against us, but peace with one another as well. Because we have been shown mercy, we can give mercy. That's Paul's desperate prayer for this, this church. Grace and peace. But the grace and peace that would be found. And it's only found in one place, and that's what he ends with, right? From, our Lord, our, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The source of this grace, the, the source of peace does not come from within us. It comes from God alone through Jesus Christ. And you'll notice here, there's one word that dominates this introduction. Do you see it? It's used over and over again. It's the word Christ. You are, we are servants of Christ. We are saints in Christ. And it is through the Lord Jesus Christ that we receive grace and peace. And it's not just this introduction that the name of Christ will dominate. The entire letter will be dominated by the name of Christ. It will be used around 70 times in this book. It is the noun that is used more than any other noun in the book of Philippians. It is the name of Jesus Christ. And Paul knows that the only way that this church will have unity is through Christ. The only way that this church will be able to face persecution is through Christ. Paul knows the only way that they will be able to defend against false teachers is through Christ. That is what they need. They need more of Christ. And friends, that's exactly what we need as well. We need more of Christ in our life. We need to submit ourselves more to his rule. We need to dwell in his presence and abide in him more and more. And as we do, the Spirit of God will empower us that we might be able to walk in the grace and peace and humility that he is calling us to walk in. And so as we start this journey together, as we walk through this letter together, may that be our prayer. God, give us more of Christ. Make Christ more the center of my life, that the outflow of my life might be the fruit of the gospel of grace and peace that you promise through Jesus. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, that's my prayer for myself. And that's my prayer for our church, Lord. God, would you grow us in grace? And would you allow us to know the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ? Father, as we come into another contentious time with elections and things happening, Lord, and the, and the temperature of our culture just raises up so many degrees, Lord, may we be people of peace. May we be people of hope. May we be citizens of the kingdom of God, knowing, Lord, that you're sovereign, you are on your throne, that you rule and that you reign. And God, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding can be ours in Christ Jesus. Father, may we be a people who demonstrate humility towards one another. May we be a people who love one another with a self-sacrificing love. May we be people who put to death pride and arrogance and self, and walk in the humility of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, this will only happen through your strength and your spirit and your word. And so, Lord, we pray. We pray for that in our lives, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.